Yeah, well, thanks for asking me. It's great to have a nice turnout here and uh, have people on uh, Zoom as well. Um, so yeah, I, I arrived um, in Perth about five months ago to take up the Professor of Mental Health post at Curtin. Um, and my background, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, um, but I started in the research field and continue in clinical research. Um, but uh, about, like I was saying, 20 years or so, I came across a theory called perceptual control theory in my attempts to try and find some kind of framework to bring together all the psychological theories and therapies that I'd learned about or was being trained in, you know, cognitive, behavioral, psychodynamic, humanistic, etc. And so it served that purpose for me in terms of helping me ground an understanding of mental health and psychological therapy. And the more I read, the more I found out that this was a framework that actually applies across the sciences and even through to the arts. Um, and so I thought it would be uh, quite uh, fitting to come here and, and uh, talk to you all about it. So there's various directions that we can go to once I've shared uh, the background that I want to share with you, because I'm not quite sure what your interest and what directions you want to take it. But I think it would be nice just to get the, the background setting, if that's all right. So I'll share my screen and hopefully this will all run smoothly. OK, so people can see that. I'll just move, see if I can move this paddle. <laughs> Probably find that. Um, yeah, put that over there, and yeah, that's okay. That will, will have to do, I think. Um, yeah, problem is my mouse has just disappeared, <laughs> which is you know always the way something like that happens. Um, let me just, yeah, I'll just try that. It's conflict exactly. <laughs> move it. I'll move it now. There you go. Put it to the top and then I'll do my play. Can you minimize the faces? Um, <laughs> yeah, put it to one side. Okay. okay. So um I've given my talk the title the automation of life because i understand that's, that's what you're yeah. interested in um engineering negative feedback control it's i'm going to talk a lot about negative feedback control but then i'm also going to talk about where consciousness and sort of the human abilities come into this this backdrop okay so first i think a good starting point around control is to remind ourselves that if it wasn't for control, we'd all be dead. Okay, so there's one reason why control is a good thing. Okay, so these are just uh, a few examples of some of the essential variables that our bodies are maintaining in survivable limits automatically as we speak, a uh, very biochemical level, blood glucose levels, the acidity of our um, chemical environments, the water levels in our bodies and various um, essential minerals like sodium, calcium, oxygen, sodium, calcium, all to do with conduction abilities of our cells. Oxygen obviously needs to be at a concentration in those cells so that they can use that for energy. Blood pressure, of course, is something that people were used to regulating and getting that checked. Um, just a few examples, obviously body temperature is another one. So, the first stop is to say control is essential without it we'd all be dead so that's probably the, that question answered okay um the next point is to argue well or to, to wonder if the the brain and the brain stem in our body is doing all this control of multiple variables at a physiological level it's very used to it it's probably got all the all the kind of um neuronal and molecular systems in place to do that. Well, maybe that would be a very parsimonious explanation if that's what the brain is doing when it's doing all the other stuff that it's involved with as well, when it's engaging 
not just with the internal environment, the internal milieu, but the outside environment. Maybe that's just control. Maybe that's the same process, but instead of sending uh, signals out through the bloodstream and having sensors within the body, those signals are going out through the muscles via stuff in the world, objects, the environment, other people, and back in again. And that's just a homeostatic process of, of checking in on those variables. And that, in a, in a nutshell, is what perceptual control theory is, a suggestion that it's that what our higher levels of our brain do is just continue this homeostatic process, but the loop, instead of being in the body, it's going out through the environment, back into the senses in this continuous, automatic way. Okay. Um, so I'll come back to that. Just to show you, you know, often when diagrams of control in biology are shown, there's a bit like this. There's say some variable like body temperature. And then there's um, a circle there at the top, you know, something conditions might, might cause a change. The thermoceptors detect it. There's a region of the brain, the hypothalamus, that compares the current temperature against a, against a set point. And we'll come back to that, the reference value. And then it will engage in some kind of output, um, which um, if, for example, um, the, ex the external conditions are cooling us down, then we might do something like shiver or constrict our external blood vessels to keep our, our uh, warmth in and our body temperature increases. But you see a lot of diagrams like this, they're not technically correct and they're not easy to extend into the psychological realm. That's another reason why we need a, another theory to help us to understand more how does homeostasis work when it's of a psychological variable. Um, however, despite the fact that there's maybe um, you know, that diagram in biology isn't complete, um, it didn't stop um, scientists, inventors, engineers for thousands of years, particularly the last 200 years, being inspired by these biological control systems in nature to build machines that essentially replicate the same functional processes as what our bodies do. Um, arguably, the first one of these was the water clock. Um, so if you have a, um, a vessel with a fixed amount of uh, water in it and a hole of a fixed size, then that, the drop of that water will be at a constant rate. But the problem is, once the water starts running out the vessel, the rate changes. So if you have something that as soon as the, um, uh, you have a regulator device, which means that as soon as the water starts to drop, something allows more water to enter in, mm -hmm. then that is this same process of, of error reduction that will keep the water at the same volume, and so the rate of the, of the drops at the same rate. And back in uh, Egypt and ancient Greece, they used that self-regulating device as the first form of clock, okay? So that arguably is the first uh, time that human beings worked out that this control process could be something that they could create and it's not just inside um, our bodies. Um, it's the same mechanism as the system in your toilet, essentially, that is self-regulating and fills itself up. Um, if we think more broadly than that, beyond, although toilets are pretty important, but more broadly beyond that, regulating temperature, which again is, all, is fundamentally a negative feedback process, that's what allows us air conditioning systems, incubators, uh, fridges, freezers, etc. That's a pretty huge advance in terms of our lifestyle. Then we've got server motors. Server motors uh, maintain an angle despite um, forces pushed against them in either direction. So the, the, the more they're pushed away from that angle, the more they put a greater force into resisting that disturbance to that change in angle. So what that means is that you can uh, create um, devices that can control the angle and keep the angle there despite the disturbances. Classically, air flights. You know, the, the flaps on, uh, on airplanes rely on that controlled angle despite all the turbulence going through as the plane's trying to land, and it needs to be able to control that angle. 
So there would be no air flight without negative feedback control, not of the kind that we've that we've got. Um, no incubators, no fridges, no freezers. Um, in the top right there is actually um, a telegraph pole uh, with um, telephone signals going through. In order to send any phone signals um, in, uh, along distances, they need to be amplified periodically as they go through the wires, because otherwise they, the signal runs out. That amplification process in the 20s was discovered uh, to be most efficiently done by a negative feedback process. And that's why we have gains in amplifiers because the gain is this error amplification process in a, in a control system. Um, and I probably should have brought in the Watts governor before <laughs> that, but it's quite a fundamental one as well. The Watts govern governor is an incredible device that some of you may know of. Um, as a, um, a steam engine is turning, it spins around these balls, okay? And the size of the balls determines how fast they spin round. Um, as they, as they uh, spin round, they rise due to the centrifugal force. If that rising motion then is, is uh, attached by a contraption to the very valve that's bringing the steam into the engine, that means that when it gets too fast, it can be connected to a device that reduces the amount of steam going in. So essentially the size of, or the weight of those balls determines the speed of the steam engine. And that's pretty necessary because behind that steam input, you've got people shoving coal into, a, you know, into some kind of furnace, which is, which is not gonna be at a constant rate. So you have to have this valve system to make sure that you have a reliable speed of your engine in for driving any machine during the industrial revolution and all of the train journeys during the industrial revolution um so i think i'm pretty sure we would be pretty much nowhere in terms of uh technological advances without negative feedback control because as i look at it air flight um to, uh, all the kind of regulating temperature systems within the machines that we have um uh, train journeys, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're pretty essential components. I think sometimes we think, oh, electronics and machine learning, you know, that's how we've got to where we are. No, none of that would be here without these fundamental advances that happened um, at least 100 years earlier. So that's my, my next point, if, if that's, that makes sense. Okay. So that's the sort of second field, if you like, of negative feedback control. We started in biology, now we're talking about machines. And then we're going to go into psychology. What if, like I said before, all the things that matter to us as human beings and as, as living organisms are also controlled through negative feedback? I've talked about our body temperature, which we sometimes use our behavior to control in terms of kind of the clothing that we use or the location that we go to. Um, but experiences like pain and discomfort, the focus of our attention, what's actually coming through our sort of foveal vision as we're looking at something, the ambient volume of something or the, the volume that we want our music that's behind that, that we're listening to, the quality, even a feeling of anxiety. It's like, well, I've got a real low tolerance of anxiety so i'm going to do whatever i can do to keep that anxiety level below that that point for example distance from a threat if you're if you kind of say a fear of an animal like a spider are you controlling that distance that you get that you are from it to keep yourself safe feelings of excitement um it might feel like a good thing to be excited but i've worked with clients who have got a diagnosis of bipolar disorder who are terrified of high feelings of excitement and so we can develop new sort of standards around some of these experiences from, from what we go through. Um, and when we have memories, often we want to remember our mem memories vividly because we have a, such an enjoyable, multifaceted life. Other times, when terrible, awful things happen to us that should never have happened, we want that vividness to be as, as, as sort of vague and blocked out and as separate from us as possible. So it's quite easy, I think, to think of psychological variables and sensory variables that we'd like to control. We've already shown how effective control is in all these domains, but maybe that's exactly what the brain does. It controls sensory variables, it controls its input. 
Um, and this, and I won't go through this in a huge amount of detail, but this is how you redraw that diagram of basic homeostasis when you're looking at a psychological control system. This is perceptual control theory, the basic unit of perceptual control theory. Um, so the idea is um, there's some aspects uh, of the environment. So you've got the environment there below the, uh, the, the grey boundary. Um, our brain has a way of um, uh, creating a perceptual signal, arguably, for some aspect of what's going on in the environment. And that's done by what's called the input function. So we might perceive the distance we are from the thing that, that we're maybe afraid of. And then we compare that distance to our reference point for that distance, our, our goal. And the further it is, the more we um, engage in actions. And that's translated, that signal is translated into actions using what's called the output function to affect something in our environment uh, through our bodies. So it might be sort of moving along the ground, for example, to control that distance. And the idea is that this is a continuous cyclical process, it's not an input output process because it's just as true that the input determines the output as it is the output determines the input it's a closed loop process and another key part of perceptual control theory is that the goal comes from a higher level system okay so the idea is that we can set goals for ourselves at a level above and we can set goals for that at a level above that so you have this hierarchical negative feedback control system, which when you take it to its um, kind of natural extremes, looks, looks like it can carry out all kinds of things that we expect human beings to do, but it's because of this layeredness of, of the hierarchy, which I'll, I'll come back to. Well, I, yeah. Sorry, I was wondering, uh, does this have any like historical relevance or like basis in like the Umbelt theory and stuff like that? In what, sorry? The Umbelt theory? Uh, Umwelt, yes. So, well, yes, in that it's it's very consistent with the idea that in order to understand animal behaviour, we have to understand what they are, their inputs, their their lived experience from their own first person perspective, mm -hmm. and so it's very consistent with that. Rather than um, trying to understand behaviour from the outside, which is the classic experimental approach, mm -hmm. PCT would argue, you know, you have to understand, try and in Try and understand it from the inside, from the organism's point of view. Yes, exactly. It's like, how would you then, if you still want to build a model yeah. from that uh, point of view, how what would it look like? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. If we just turn you, can I just ask you about what determines both the goals and the references? Uh, well, goals and references are the same thing, essentially. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we'll come to that. Right. Yeah. But what I want to do next, if that's okay, is give you a little bit of a demo. I'm not sure if some of you've seen this or not before or not. Okay, so I'll put this larger on the screen if I can do that. Right. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you a very simple demo. Uh, sometimes do this live, but I've got a video just in case. Um, I'm the person on the right with a pen, and my my marks of the pen are going to be left on the page, and yeah. Pardon me, a volunteer is on the left. Um, their marks are going to be left on the page. But I've uh, given the volunteer with the green pen an, an instruction. I've told them what to do. Okay. And you've got to watch this video and try and work out what that person on the left was told to do. Okay. It's only a 30 second video. To imitate it. But the yeah. Okay. So we've got two guesses there. One is to imitate, one is to do the opposite. What is your job in this example? Um, I'll tell you that at, at the end. So who thinks it was to... Or oh, even to pre predict it, right? To think what we want to do. Okay, it's interesting you've generated three because they can't all be right. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, I can do with it. Anyone put that? Yeah. Anyone put? <laughs> no, no, it's great. Anyone want to put their hand up if they agree that it's either or think it's either imitation, copying, or prediction? Yeah. 
I actually think that you can not touch to draw something. Yeah, yeah. That's another that, one. And then I will draw a graphic on that to be honest. Oh. Yeah. So between you, you've covered all the popular uh, yeah. explanations of this. We did a study on this. We canvassed hundreds of people. Yeah. And the most popular ones are doing the opposite um, or mirror image, uh, copying uh, what the other person's doing or uh, trying to draw something. Unfortunately, all of those are completely wrong. None of them are the instructions that the person was doing or thinks they're doing whilst they're doing the task. They're all things that you observe. They all happened, but none of them are what the person's actually doing. Well, that's something that's the, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, drawing the eyes closed? No, but that oh. we'd sometimes have these. Is it something about um, feeling your thoughts and you subjust focusing on the actions you're doing you are getting there. Mm -hmm. Keep the pen in one place. It's yes. about keeping something in one place, but what is it about Keep keeping in one place? Hand, Watch it again. Go on, go on, Chris, you're getting there. Ah, yeah. Oh, another another yes. Yeah. Second time ah, round with a bit of discussion. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and, so and we know this is a, and it's not just, if you think about it, that dot is above the page. And depending on what angle you're sitting, there's going to be a bit of parallax error. And when we've built computer models of this, it actually, the optimum fit is a little bit of a parallax error to the left-hand side, because the person's controlling what they what their perception of the knots being over the dots. Okay, And obviously, depending on where people are sat, they're all going to have different perceptions of Mm -hmm. of, of how close or not is to the dots. So why do you think, I think that is such an important demonstration? I think, because you, you know, because we all can read, you know, it's interesting to see also what people come up with to start with, with what they think you are mm -hmm. to say. And that yeah. shows the, you know, again, how, Psychologically, we think it's imitating or doing the opposite. Yeah, we, we look at what we see in people's behavior and we say, oh, I know what that is. You know, we're very judgmental as, as a species, yeah. you know, and we've developed a whole scientific approach based on that, that assumption that the person on the outside knows the person on the inside better or the animal on the inside. But it's completely wrong. And it's also <laughs> always in relation to the other person while there is a third element that none of us saw. So it's, you know, we kind of have this tendency to think yeah, that we go yeah, against yeah. or meet each other yeah. rather than look at the variable yeah. that is actually outside the world. Yeah. yeah. What I also find interesting is obviously you're the one in control in the sense that you're the one who's pulling it. Mm -hmm. And you, the marks that you left are way simpler than the marks that the other person left. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like so much more complex to try and find this balance mm -hmm. then create the imbalance. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I guarantee you that if we did that over again, again even if I did the very similar, it would be different each very time. Different. Yeah, because they're not trying to copy the pattern. Mm -hmm. They're trying to keep not over the dots mm -hmm. and they're doing whatever they need to do in that moment to correct that error. Okay, But in doing so, what emerges as a side effect of that control is drawing a picture of something that looks like a kangaroo, mm -hmm. doing the opposite of someone else copying them you know isn't that interesting all what somebody wants is keep them not over a dot and they can be told that they're copying people that they're doing the opposite from me you're drawing that oh i didn't even know i was doing it and that's what people say i didn't know i drew a picture i didn't know i was doing the opposite of you so and now, now imagine the not over the dot is something like um trying to never be anxious or trying to never have a certain memory come to mind of trying to be the most important person in the room okay imagine you are keeping to that goal constantly and what behaviors trying to be stimulated all the time you know imagine imagine what behaviors might emerge depending on the situation if you kept to that goal so if you wanted to be um you know never anxious depending on what the other person did, you'd have to do what you needed to do to, for them, for what they say and did, not to make you feel anxious. Change the subject, move away, avoid eye contact, drink alcohol, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. Heroin? 
whatever, anything. It, everyone's got their own poison. How many things you will lose as well because you're so powerful. Yeah, and that's and that what that reminds us again, going back to looking at you know that physiologically we've got hundreds of variables to control. Psychologically, we've probably got hundreds or thousands of variables to control. We can't live a life just controlling one thing. There needs to be some way that we organize the relatedness of all the different things we're trying to control in our lives so that somehow we've got this unitary thing we call personality which balances them all over time and so that's sort of the next one of the one of the sort of next points of that okay so let's carry on a little bit because we're getting going we don't know. so yeah so this is where it comes to the hierarchy so the idea is that our nervous system is organized in layers, probably develops in early infancy, the first uh, couple of years in, in humans. Um, it's a branching process and the very um, immediate inputs are controlled at the low levels. So like that sort of intensity of, of feeling, intensity of light, intensity of sound. And then from there, we need to, we need to organize things so that it gets more and more sort of complex and long-term as you go up levels. Um, so then we might, for example, um, so something simple like making a cup of tea. Um, we can go up levels and ask ourselves why we're making a cup of tea in order to maybe you're making it to, to uh, like have a nice conversation with a friend and you want to help them. And going down levels, we can ask, well, what are you doing to make a cup of tea? Well, you have to to make sure you've got all the things available, the water and the kettle, you have to sequence them in the right order, you know, and you have to make sure things are the right temperature, et cetera. So there's ways to go down levels to, to, to implement that, that action as well. So from a PCT perspective, behavior isn't a linear sequence of actions. It's this quite very rich hierarchy that's constantly sending down sig signals to say, I want more of this, and sending up signals that says, oh, there's just enough, there's too much, and adjusting it continuously. Okay. Um, and it's obviously vastly more complex than these diagrams, but that's just to show you, give you a I bit of an answer. Right, there's like an ambiguity, but they're sort of branching up to this singular point or whether it's coming from. Okay. Yeah, and it's going two ways, and there will be more than one of those, but it's just to give you an example of this sort of fractal yeah. sort of branching yeah. structure. So now simplified a bit more. On the right now, we've got that hierarchy, but I've, I've simplified it, just put it, and there's, there's many levels of this system. This is the, what we call the learnt hierarchy. This is what we uh, develop during our lifetime because we perceive aspects of, of ourselves in the world and we learn which of those work for us. But they ne we need to, have some basis to learn and develop that hierarchy. And this is where another control system comes in, which is essentially much more similar to those biological ones we talked about earlier. And Bill Powell's called them intrinsic systems. So, um, so if you think about uh, an infant, when they get, uh, when they get cold, and uh, let's give you an example, when they, when they get cold, they're gonna be looking around for some source of warmth, okay? And so, they, and, we, and so what's um, described in PCT is a process called reorganization, which allows them to change the way they are um, perceiving uh, their environment to find something near them that's going to give them that warmth. And, and often it'll be they'll cry and then their the parent will come to them and they start to learn the perceptual qualities of that reliable parent, their smell, their appearance, etc. And that's building up in the perceptual hierarchy. Uh, the idea is that we have obviously multiple biological systems which are at, if they're out of kilter, the rest of us needs to learn some way of how am I going to learn something to perceive near to me in my environment that's going to help me survive and reproduce and give me some of, um, uh, keep, you know, keep me going at a biological level. So the idea is that the, and this comes back to the question, the biological goals or these intrinsic reference signals we're, we're born with, they will develop through evolution, but, but they are used as kind of set points to guide the development of the perceptual hierarchy, which is all developed during our lifetime from a very early age. 
So they're like a sort of a, a guiding um, point to help the perceptual hierarchy learn. So the simplest one would be to think of a classic kind of imprinting idea that you've got this biological system to be close to your caregiver, but who that caregiver is and what their perceptual qualities are, even if they're a different species, that's going to be learnt through experience. Yeah. Um, so, so this is how things are un unfolding, but we, I don't think we're still at consciousness yet necessarily. Um, one of the biggest challenges that happens to any complex system that's controlling lots of things, whether it's an organization or a production line or a person, is conflict. It's where trying to control one thing gets in the way of trying to control other things. And at a very mundane level, that's about how we manage our time because of all the different goals we have in our lives around our family and our work and our personal development and our safety, et cetera. Um, they potentially might conflict, but sometimes you get quite fundamental conflicts. And I gave you an example of, um, of excitement, of vividness of memories, and this example here of distance from something you're afraid of. You know, a lot of time people want to want to get closer to things they're afraid of because they want to face their fears, but at the same time, they're very afraid of going close. And so, but actually these conflicts occur all the way through the system potentially. And the, a, a critical part of learning and reorganization is resolving conflicts. So we're resolving those struggles with ourselves. And it even happens very simply when an, when an infant's learning to move their muscles to coordinate because we've, our, our muscles are in ag, uh, antagonistic pairs and we need to, and movements of one is going to conflict the movements of the other. So throughout the whole system, we're resolving conflict. The idea with, in PCT is that we resolve conflict by developing a new system above the ones that are in conflict such that it sends out signals, sends out goals to the ones in conflict so that they don't conflict anymore. So it, so, um, it sort of might balance them over time or it might switch to different goals, uh, for example. Um, within, within our high level conflicts, we, we often, I would argue, we often see this as a new perspective or an insight or an epiphany. And we just go, wait a minute, I think I just understand what being brave is about. I've had this conversation with my kids, like being brave is about not feeling scared. It's like, no, being brave isn't about not being scared. It's about feeling scared and doing it anyway. And that to me, being brave, the concept, once we get it at an implicit level, is the construct of balancing fear of something with good reason to face it. And so we develop these higher level um, perceptions. And I think we, we require, uh, that is a conscious process of meaning making. And, I, and I, I guess my proposal is consciousness is about building up these high level um, uh, perceptions of ourselves in the world. And that's why we keep conscious because you never know when you're gonna need a new principle or value or concept of, of yourself in, in the world. So um, I've got a lovely picture of a scene in nature here. This is where it comes back to biology again. If it's so useful for us, we, we've got multiple goals, we have to reorganize, we have to resolve conflicts, we need to we do that by generating high level uh, perceptions of our experience. Wouldn't it be handy and efficient if, if biologically as a species, we had an intrinsic system which just kept us doing that regardless, okay? The problem with only reorganizing when, you're, when your body temperature goes down or when you're in pain is that you only learn when bad things happen to you. And it also, and if that's the only time you're conscious, then your conscious life is gonna be blanked out for long periods when things are lovely, you know, and you're not gonna be learning anything. And that's not really going to be the basis of forming a human narrative of life. So what, what, what would be interesting is if we as human beings and maybe other animals had a biological system that fills in all those gaps and makes it feel um, intrinsic that we need to keep learning, that we're curious, that we want to take in new information, that we get distracted by other things, our mind wanders, 
so that there's this continuity of meaning making. Because once you've got a continuity of this process, you can then start to, to put labels on it, like words, you can start to see yourself as a constant agent in the world. And so luckily, arguably, we grew up in this kind of environment where there were lots of things that we could, we could notice, get distracted by, start to form and classify and perceive. We grew up in an environment of biological complexity where there's going to be all kinds of things that we can notice and just kind of draw into our, our kind of meaning making process in nature. But often we were in this environment, um, but this came from a reviewer's suggestion that, you know, surely we can stay conscious if we just stuck in a plain room where we're not taking in any new information. Surely, if this idea is correct, that consciousness is about constant, continuous meaning making, that we shouldn't be able to just sit in a blank room and do nothing, staring at the wall. Well, I tried it. Um, as <laughs> soon as I started staring at the wall, I noticed all the shapes of the dimples of the paint that had happened. Um, I asked my kids to do it and they, they just were just talking and just saying, why am I doing this? This is boring. Um, I tried to do it. I could maybe do it for a few seconds, but my mind started wandering. Okay. So it seems that it's, and there's a whole history of studies on sensory deprivation, you know, where your mind just fills with stuff. Uh, there's work on in the military on vigilance and how hard it is. So it appears that it's actually potentially, or this is what I really want to do an experiment on, impossible to maintain a genuinely monotonous input to the senses. Um, and so what my proposal is, is that there's this control system, which is requiring this constant input to make new meaning out of, to bring together for a new perceptual function in PCT terms. And that if you interfere with it, it'll just go somewhere else to try and get that input, okay? And that's the nature of a control system. It's resistant to disturbances, just like a flushing toilet or, um, you know, an incubator. And so that's this sort of proposal that, that, that is the, sort of the engine, not the spark of consciousness, but the engine of consciousness that keeps it. Well, you work with people with uh, syndrome? Uh, I've, read a, I've, read a, I've read a book on it, Ghost Boy, is, which is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, and that's interesting again because they 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 can they can still observe. They're constantly taking things in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so yeah. So I think I've just explained that all that in that slide. And so I guess this is the essentially I guess the, the consciousness model. Um, probably goes a bit beyond the aims of today. I think, but that that yellow item there, this control of what I call novel information integration rate. So because we're controlling for that, um, we are able to develop these higher order perspectives, which then gives us a capacity for language and, and self and collective um, shared, shared control of our environment. Um, and that we maintain that integration rate through all kinds of things like distraction, search, exploration, self-stimulation, but also some internal mechanisms like imagery, mind wandering, um, and a, a, a process around buffering in memory, which I talk about. And then mutation rate reorganization as well, I guess, which is interesting, maybe from an artistic point of view as well, that um, we can, just like in natural selection, we can apply increased variation to our, to our, to the way that we input our experience. And if our, our external environment isn't giving us that novelty, then our brain can apply kind of enhanced variability to that input. And that might be the source of things like hallucinations in sensory deprivation, but potentially might help explain things like psychosis, but also creativity. Um, so that's the consciousness model. One thing I've not put in yet in detail, I talked about language, what language arguably and other forms of symbolic coding allows to do is create, and this is again a bit for novel part theory, a sort of parallel hierarchy 
to the perceptual hierarchy. The perceptual hierarchy works automatically, according to this theory. As, as certain uh, focus, certain units of that hierarchy are brought into, uh, are allowed to reorganize, that's the sort of spark of consciousness. It's maintained through this uh, maintaining information integration rate. As that is done so, it allows access to this propositional system, this symbolic coding system, which has got a kind of a two-way mapping between, you know, the image of a cat and the word cat, you know, and the sound of the word cat. We've got these propositional structures, mathematics, language, autobiographical knowledge, etc., that that somehow exists conceptually in parallel with um, this perceptual system. And that allows us as human beings to share plans, to share instructions so that people can kind of recreate <laughs> in their own lived space, some kind of um, approximation through language or through a, a blueprint to something in their own lives. Um, okay, so what, what am I saying? Humans and other living organisms and some machines are control systems. And it's a great thing. <laughs> um, multiple control systems form collective control networks. Now, I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but it might be a direction you want to go to. A colleague of mine, Kent McClelland, has really expanded on how, as human societies, we work together for shared goals based on this, this theory. Control is purposive, and yet it operates automatically as a default without consciousness. But human consciousness may involve this sort of real real time optimization and re, reprioritization re of control through generating and developing new higher level perceptions of incoming uh, signals. Um, and the conscious life for us humans is often about this real world current reprioritization of our biological needs, our kind of perceptual goals, which is our ego, if you like, and our plans and our shoulds and our kind of logical requirements. And those three different domains of goals on, are in completely different kind of representational space. And so there is no grand plan for that, that you can then code somewhere. And that's why it's conscious, because it's constantly under, under kind of reformulation within our own brains. And that's why it's totally new and fresh all the time. Um, the exciting thing for the clinical work is that this means that, you know, often when you work, when you talk to a therapist, they will tell you what, how they're doing a change, a change strategy to help someone get insight or to help them reappraise. What this model suggests is people are, const are constantly have the opportunity for reappraisal of their experience every conscious moment of their life so all you need to do is help them direct that conscious process to where it's going to make an important difference and you're done so really we don't need all the bells and whistles of therapy except some capacity for the therapist to help the client shift and direct this powerful tool of consciousness to where it's going to make an actual genuine difference to the distress and issues that that person is going through. Um, and there's a lot of work on awareness and control of awareness and mindfulness, et cetera, in, in therapy. But I think this account gives us a much more parsimonious way of harnessing that. Um, research implications, it tells us that if we wanna do really high grade research, we need to be not just taking self reports, not just measuring things we observe, but trying to, uh, and not just listening to people, but trying to build and reconstruct models of how a person or an animal um, creates and maintains these lived experience for itself, and then see if that model then uh, behaves or, or has data that's similar to how the real thing um, is in the world. Um, it's quite, it's, it's even difficult to do for tracking studies, just to build models of people tracking a cursor on the screen. <laughs> so it's gonna be extremely hard for some of the concepts that we're interested in, but that is the kind of gold standard in terms of research direction. Um, and arguably, to, and Bill Powers was no, he was not shy about talking about societal implications of this theory. 
because according to this theory, there's no, it's, it's not like there's a, a good set of behaviors and a bad set of behaviors, a good set of thoughts and a bad set of thoughts. Everything is relative. It's a psychological theory of relativity, PCT. What creates problems is when one part of a connected system wants, wants one thing and another part wants the opposite. And it creates that, that conflict, that struggle. And if we can understand that all problems are essentially conflict problems, then our, what we need to do is help people talk about conflicts at whatever level that is, internal, kind of uh, family, community, or kind of international. Um, and so that's a good starting point, I think, for discussion. Thank you so much.